Hi everyone and welcome to Caroline Smith's episode 13. Um, I cannot believe we are already at 13. Um, we're not too far away from my one year mark, um, which is quite exciting. Um, so my name is Caroline and I live in Scotland uh, with my partner Ben and my puppy Fela. Um, I am originally Danish, but I've lived in Scotland now for over seven years. Uh, time time flies. Um, so yes, I knit a lot of Scandinavian patterns. I started knitting in May 2020. I am a true uh, <laughs> lockdown hobby knitter that then um, clearly developed a bit of an obsession. Um, today we're filming in a new location. It is Sunday afternoon. It's about half four. It is... Um, an October day in Scotland so it's raining <laughs> and it's getting quite dark. I have moved to my, uh, this is our spare room, it is also the room that all the boxes and stuff we haven't dealt with uh, since we moved into our um, first house in May. This is where all lives so I've tried to um, carefully place myself in front of it but in case you do see some of it peeking through I hope you all know the feeling of when you move and you just stuff crap in corners and plan to deal with it later. I am also facing, I guess, like the road that the house is on, which um, for what is actually quite a quiet area gets com like gets so busy. Um, so you will probably hear cars and people coming and going. Um, but this is the only bedroom that faces south. Um, so this is basically where the most sunlight is. So I'm also hoping that none of my neighbours look out of their window and just see someone <laughs> speaking to themselves in their bedroom. Um, Yes, so I very quickly got ready. I have spent um, my Sunday morning on the sofa with Papa and Ben uh, just knitting and we've been watching extended editions of Lord of the Rings, brilliant. Um, and then I have been an incredibly boring adult and spent the rest of the morning cleaning and tidying. And I suddenly realised that time was like running away from me. <laughs> uh, so Ben has taken Fela on a walk. So hopefully today we will not be disturbed by the puppy. Um, if you are new to my channel, Fela uh, is my puppy. Uh, she is uh, just a, a bit over four months now. Uh, four months old, uh, Border Collie Labrador mix. She is the cutest and funniest puppy ever. Um, and she has features in the last two episodes, but you guys, as much as I love her, it is really hard to film <laughs> while you're also trying to entertain <laughs> a puppy especially when she will not sleep on your lap like she did in the first one. So um, if my hair looks a little bit damp, it's because I decided I would rather rush through and film on the weekend than try to film on a weekday where I also have to deal with Poppy. Um, I also think now we're going into the darker season. For any podcasters out there, I'd love to know if you've bought any sort of equipment to prepare yourself. <laughs> um, I'm thinking I will probably have to buy a ring light. Um, because it gets dark so early here. Obviously now with Fela, we go for walks every day and I'm really noticing how early it's get, getting dark. Um, we actually took her for a walk uh, earlier this week. I just bought like a little um, light that goes on her collar and um, I was, you know, I just put it on mainly thinking, oh, we can see how it is before it gets proper dark. And it actually got so dark, I was really glad <laughs> she had it on. Um, the good thing is that we're obviously hitting peak knitwear season. I have spoken a bit about my knitting mojo in the past few episodes. Um, lost it just after we got the puppy because I had no sleep and she was so much and biting everything. And um, it is back 110%. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Um, it's been really lovely to have knitting uh uh, the past few weeks. Um, I've had uh, some tough weeks at work. I have definitely been quite home homesick. Uh, that always comes and goes for me. I miss my family load <laughs> at the moment. So I'm really happy that I have knitting and my knitting friends. Uh, speaking of knitting friends, if you do want to get hold of me, I am 100% the most accessible on Instagram. I use Ravelry to keep track of how much yarn I use for different projects and what size I knit and to store photos of the projects um but i don't really use the other features so if you want to get hold of me it's on instagram um as usual i always keep quite a detailed description box so if you want to see the yarn and all of this you can look in the description box um and um i just want to say thank you to everyone who's 
uh, who subscribed and liked and commented. Um, I'm now uh, over 2,000 subscribers, which is insane. <laughs> um, it's crazy how funny podcast is out there. Um, the, it was probably not before about episode eight that I actually started really gaining subscribers. And um, if you're out there and you're a smaller channel, uh, don't be too disheartened. Um, you know, I think it just takes time for the algorithm to find you and to suggest you to people. Um, but yes, thank you to everyone who subscribed. Um, let's start with the classic, um, what am I wearing today? So I don't have any finished objects. So this isn't actually a, an object I've just finished. This was a test knit for Augustine's. I think it's Augustine's number 17, but I'm not sure. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, this yarn uh, for this uh, sweater, I guess it is, sweater t-shirt, um, was kindly sponsored by Knitting for Olive. It's knit in one strand of their double soft merino and one strand of their silk my hair. I finished this or well, test knitted it for Augustine's back in June. Um, I basically received the yarn like the third day we were in the house and knitted it in about a week. It's quite a quick knit on big needles. I will say though that in retrospect I picked the wrong colour. Um, I love the look of these kind of blushy sort of pinky tones, um, especially I have another project from Knitting from Olive that is in a similar tone, just slightly darker. And um, as much as I love the look of the yarn and I love the look of the object like not on me, I can just tell it's not actually a colour I'm particularly drawn to wearing, which is quite funny. I guess um, as you become, I guess you knit more and more and create more and more things, it's kind of funny how you can be really drawn to certain shades. Like I am always like first off drawn to mauve, like mauve and pinks and all of this and they just, I don't really think they're my colour. So this has definitely not gotten as much wear as it probably should. Um, but I thought I'd wear it today. It has cute little sleeves where you have an elastic that keeps it tight. I've just been watching Hive Knits podcast where she talks about adding elastics to things and I thought I'd add that another place you can do it is here so you kind of create that um, like ruffle effect I guess and then it has um, these are double folded like a double folded um, edging I can't remember what it's called it has that on the bottom as well and then it has um, quite a big eye cold that you pick up and knit it is knit a uh, completely seamless top down so actually while the sleeves look to pick up, this is actually just increases, which is quite neat. Um, yeah, what else is there to say about it? Um, I think um, I gave some comments on the fit. So I always knit patterns. When I test knit, I always knit patterns completely as described. And um, I think the length is a bit wrong. I think the length is too long for my size. Um, and also um, this was really a project where I test knitted my size, um, but it's quite clear to me that I should have sized at least one size down, if not two. Um, I've spoken about this before, um, but I am very much, um, I'm not keen on like mahusive positive ease um, on me. I just think um, my bust is so big that I lose all shape in it. So, um, but actually, uh, for the podcast episode today, I've put on like mum jeans that are quite high waisted and like tucked it in and it looks quite cute. But yes, I have probably not worn this as much as I should. So at least I can wear it for the podcast today. Um, right, enough about what I'm wearing. As I said, um, there is um, no finished objects today. I'm not far off finishing my first project. Um, but I decided not to wait because I'm kind of at a funny place where if I waited a week longer, I just feel like there'd be too much to talk about. So um, my main whip since I have seen you last has been this, um, which is my Phil Kalana Nordstrand. Oh, there it is. I was like, I'm definitely going to drop stitches here. Let's pull these through. So this is the sweater. Um, that's the back. So here we have the front. So it is a lovely um, colour um, colour work yoke sweater with a very long um, what will become like a big thick roll neck and um, I finished the sleeves um, as well um, and 
um, I should say for the sleeves, I did not need, knit these according to the pattern. I added uh, two more decreases on the sleeve so you can see how it slowly tapers in. I think in the original pattern they're meant to be sort of like, sort of slightly looser, relaxed rip, uh, ribbing. And I knew that this jumper for me is 100% um, meant to be keeping me warm while dog walking. <laughs> it's going to be like a casual sweater. And so I didn't want big loose sleeves because I reckon they'll be quite annoying underneath like a jacket or whatever. Um, the construction is top down, uh, fully in the round as you would probably expect from me. It seems to be my favorite. Um, and it has a uh, short rows in the back. Um, I did a turpular cast on so that the edge is quite seamless and stretchy. Um, I think the, the neck looks quite wide. I reckon it would be quite a comfy fit, but again, what I wanted. Um, and yeah, so I'm just at the sort of very bottom part. Um, so I think I have another probably, I don't know, five, 10 centimeters left of stockinette and then just some ribbing and I'm all done. So I'm hoping to finish this in the next few days. Um, and before I move on to like the big part, which is obviously that this is my first color work sweater, I should talk about the yarn. Uh, so the yarn, um, Philklana Nordstrand is designed by Hannah Raymond and it's actually a free pattern from Philklana. It is also available in English. And um, the original yarn is one strand Peruvian Highland wool with uh, Telia or Philklana Telia, which I actually have for different projects I can show you. So Telia is Philklana's um, soft silk mohair. Um, but as this has like such a high neck, I didn't actually want my hair. I wanted something that I knew wasn't, would have no itch factor. So I replaced the soft silk my hair with Elva, uh, Phil Kalana Elva, um, which is one of their newer qualities. And um, it is 100% um, alpaca <laughs> and it runs 175 meters to 25 grams. So it's um, has slightly less yardage than um, traditional mohair. Um, oh, you can hear that, that ice cream man like drives around all the time. It drives me bonkers. Um, so yes, um, I replaced the one strand with Elva and it, to me, thickness wise is quite similar to mohair. I don't think you will struggle to replace it like for like. You probably just need one more ball of Elva than you would of, of a mohair. Um, but Elva is also cheaper. I think one ball of Elva is about four pounds and Telia, I think has increased to seven pounds or eight pounds um, from knit.co.uk. Um, I should also say, well, I would have, would have marked it when we started talking, but um, the Peruvian Highland wool in marzipan, which is my main color together with Peruvian Highland wool in, or Peruvian Highland wool, no, uh, together with Elva in marzipan. So this is my main color. Uh, the Peruvian Highland wool I bought myself start of this year uh, as like a stockpiling exercise almost and then um, uh, the Elva I had uh, I've had gifted from knit.co.uk together with um, my contrast colour so I use less than two balls of Peruvian Highland wool for the contrast colour and I used one ball of Elva less than one ball of Elva in this uh in these colors so i'll link the colors down below but they are essentially you know they are essentially one is merlot the other one is boudoir 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 that's one i always get that wrong um which i think creates this lovely like quite stark contrast and um as you may know this kind of like dark red is my favorite color i did everything in that if i could um i am using the recommended needle uh needle size i met gauge for swatch so that's good i will say I don't think like my gauge is definitely not perfect. I think the short rows you can see back here, uh, they do have like, lines um, probably because my my knitting and purling just wasn't spot on. And um, yeah, I can live with that. I also think around the front, you can see that at the very start of the body, it's like the gauge is looser and then it gets tighter. I think it's because um, it's a, it's around round yoke um so meaning um when i say round yoke instead of a raglan where you take out every other round for example or you increase every round with a round yoke it's every few rounds so you then do lots more increases 
um, most of the increases are actually before the colour work pattern um, so you can definitely see them in this yarn choice um, which I don't know if I love but I also don't hate it and um, I don't think it looks that even just yet it's like the Peruvian um, just has like a bit more texture to it that means it looks a bit more yeah just not as even um, but I'm sure some of it at least will even out in the wash um, so yeah um, so far I'm really happy with the choice this feels perfectly soft and I know it will soften up more when, <laughs> when I've done a full wash um, for the colour work, I went up half a needle size. So I watched a few podcasters that have recently done their first colour work project. And I could see a common theme is obviously that you tend to knit tighter with colour work. And I basically wanted to avoid that. So um, it seems that a recommended fix for that is just to size up a needle size for the colour work. So the rest of the sweater is knit on four and a half millimetres, but um, the colour work I knit on five. And as you can see, this is where the colour work is. I, it's not really any puckering. So um, I'm quite I'm quite chuffed with that, actually, um, because um, I should probably have done a swatch with the colour work colour in it. But I didn't um, because I like to live life on the edge. So <laughs> these first rows of colour work, are my, they're just my first colour work. So it's all good. Um, I was really uncertain how I was going to hold the yarn, so I am um, a continental or Norwegian style knitter, meaning um, I have yarn wrapped around my left hand and um, I have gauge, like when, or the way I hold tension is I wrap it like this and then I actually just keep it flat under my hand and then I essentially tension it against the needle. Um, that is how I've always knitted. I keep when I knit, I keep this finger quite tight. And um, I was a bit uncertain how I was gonna do that with two strands. Someone whose message has later disappeared. <laughs> um, and I just saw like the first few lines of it one day and then I didn't reply. I'm really bad at keeping on top of Instagram messages. Um, recommended that I got one of those color work rings. So I bought one from No Frails Knitting. Unfortunately, she only had the large size and um, it was just a tiny bit too big and I think for me because of the way I tensioned the yarn um, you know the colour work um, needle or needle the colour work ring essentially has like holes that you thread the yarn through and I just found that as I couldn't feel the yarn I couldn't feel my tension so I gave up on that pretty quickly and what ended up is a model where I essentially had um, the main colour here and the contrast colour here and then they were separated by this bit so often the contrast colour slit all the way down here on my finger which wasn't particularly comfortable but also wasn't very uncomfortable and with time I think I had quite good knitting speed with that so if I was to knit another jumper I'd probably do the same. Um, I have so a lot of the Norwegian like in the Norwegian knitting community they have quite a few like Instagrams where you have different people like visiting and the whole purpose of it is essentially that um you know you have like a group of say 15 women and they kind of talk you through what they've been knitting they have different themes etc and being no you know it being Norwegian um often <laughs> colour work comes up because it's quite traditional Norwegian um and I am very glad that I've seen a lot of those because they always say that one of the most important things when knitting colour work is picking a dominant colour and not changing it because it ruins the, the look of the knit, it will look quite uneven and that you should always pick the colour that you want the most dominant, you should have that closest to your heart, which I now hope is right because I didn't look any of this up right, I just assumed that must be true and I remembered correctly. So um, yes, the contrast colour is what I hope I've held dominant. I, I think it must be because I, I do think this red and the stitches here look more dominant or bigger than the main colour. Um, for floats, right, I, since it's stocking it, it's not too bad if I lose the stitches, but also uh, always time for that. So this is the inside of um, the knitting project. So the very first few rows up here you can see they have quite long floats um, and I was a bit uncertain whether I should um, catch my floats 
I also apologise for the um, shutty like weaving in. Um, there was some holes up here from the short rows which have just neatly just sewn together. Um, and usually after I wash it, I can always trim, uh, trim the yarn, but I do like the yarn to have room to stretch basically with washing. So I always have really long ends after weaving. Um, but yeah, so the first, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I should catch my float, so I decided not to and see how it was. As this is purely, um, purely um, on the, on the chest um, or on the yoke, I was like, it's not really going to catch, catch as much as like putting your fingers and with my long nails like through a sleeve. So I hope I'm not going to come to regret it, but like, I'm, I don't think they are that long floats. Um, and then as you can see it going down, that one sticks out not too nice. I've stretched that one a little bit too much. And then at the very end, um, I caught, so the last few rows had like even longer floats than up here. And I was like, yeah, you know, I think they, you know, the yarn was carried over easily eight stitches or something. I was like, that's, that's going to need catching for floats. I asked lovely Laura from Penrose Knits and she's like, oh, that isn't like what she thought about how quick, like how often I should catch floats. And she's like, oh, that isn't really like a proper rule, but I usually go for, I think every three or four um stitches that she would catch floats so that's what i've done you can see them like caught right there um and i wasn't <clears throat> earlier on i'd kind of done a wrap i don't know what row that would be on i feel like it should be really obvious i think i think it might be that row i'm not sure i can't find it now see it in the color work um but yeah so i the first ones I'd done by twisting it, but I found that was really cumbersome and took a long time and all the strands got twisted and it was just something I vaguely remembered from um, when I'd sort of looked up how to do colour work like ages ago. So um, I finally looked up properly how to catch floats instead of just imagining I knew. So the good thing about holding the yarns on one finger is that uh, the, the floats I, were, I was catching was um, obviously the contrast colour. So I basically found out that usually you would pick the yarn going over and then, you know, knitting your stitch. Um, but that if you want to catch floats continental, you can basically put the needle underneath the contrast color, catch the dominant color and then push it off. And then um, when you then knit the, the next strand, normally it creates that uh, nice catch of the float. The, the woman, I can't remember what video I watched. The woman was like, oh, I find this really cumbersome and that it takes a long time and it really slows down my speed. I'm not fast enough at color work that I really think it slowed me down that much and I'm actually really happy with how uh, that kind of wraps the, the, the float so um, if there are more, more techniques I'd probably still stick with that because I think it looks really nice and um, I was kind of nervous um, how I have not dropped a stitch yet well, I will never understand um, so um, I think it still looks like quite nice on this side like I don't think there's too much red uh, showing through not even where I've caught the floats so yes pretty happy with this um well should I say I knit a size down I think this is an XL I think the original pattern goes up to 2XL but as usual wanted less positivities um I'm knitting the waist decreases as described in the pattern but I don't think it looks that obvious that that increases so I'll have to see how much I feel like it changes to fit once I'm done but yes um this has been really great fun um certainly not my last color work project I still think I still think I prefer um I still think I prefer like lace knitting for diagrams than I do or charts I should say I don't know I call it diagrams because it's called diagrams in Danish and then you translate directly uh, by <laughs> bilingual problems um, but I, I think I still prefer like lace knitting, um, but it has been fun and I would certainly do another, uh, color work, uh, sweater again. Um, I basically, the good thing about using this one from Phil Kalana was that I already had the master pan in my stash and it was one of those, I was like, I bought the yarn with no project in mind and it was, I kind of felt like it. Because it was a neutral, I think I'm worse at using up the neutrals because I'm kind of like, oh, if it's a neutral colour, I should really think about what I use it for. But I thought it was better just to to sort of get it, 
gets at you so I'm really glad I've used it up um, another thing about doing the colour work sweater um, what it really sort of made me think about I guess you could say um, is about um, per like being a perfectionist when it comes to knitting um, a lot of podcasters that I watch are very much like oh I knitted a whole jumper and then I hated how I'd done the decreases or the gauge wasn't as good as like you know wasn't perfect or spot on or um, um, maybe the pooling for um, hand-dyed yarn or a lot of these things and they will rip it all back um, and often it's you know wanting the final project to be quite perfect and I do not feel that way inclined <laughs> Um, I would quite like to, at the very end, unless this episode is really long, I would like to show you the sweaters that I have been wearing around Papa and uh, talk about why some of my sweaters, that even though I love them and I use them loads, why they aren't necessarily a perfect project. Um, and I have to be honest and say, in the rest of my life, I am an extreme perfectionist to the point that I will not finish something if I don't think it's good enough and um, that sometimes my perfectionism or my desire for control and organizing and all of these things have in the past been borderline obsessive um you know i used to be someone who color coordinated to the point that it would take more time and serve no purpose essentially and the funny thing is i you would think i would feel that way about knitting and i really truly don't i it the mistake has to be severe before i'd even think about fixing it i just you know, in this um, colour work sweater, there are things I would have done differently. You know, the uh, the short rows weren't too good. Um, when I saw basically where I'd done the turn, it was like I hadn't tightened the final short row stitch hard enough and it just let, left a little hole. Probably because I should have done one whole round of stockinette before starting uh, the short rows because I often find that if you go straight from um, knitting ribbing to short rows, then it looks a bit like it create holes and I think if I'd seen that earlier I might have redone the short rows but when I saw it I'd done the whole colour work section and I was like you know what I am not going to rip back for that I'll sew it together it'll be fine enough for distance and that is to be honest how I feel about most of my projects it is very very rare uh, that any of my projects makes me want to rip it back and I kind of like to embrace the fact that my things look really handmade this is obviously not a dig or an attack at people who are much more like diligent and actually wants to do things properly, but more a reflection of how I have realised that if I'm too much of a perfectionist with knitting, it would actually stop me getting projects done. And I thought that would just be so sad considering how much I love knitting. Um, so I would love to hear if you're the type of person who throw things back, how bad do things have to be for you for you to, you know, start over or rip things back? I am also known if the stitch count doesn't work for ripping, I just knit the final two stitches together. And in general, I just think I'm quite relaxed. Like for this, <laughs> when I got to the sleeves, um, my, so the ribbing on this is only half a needle size down. And when I got to the ribbing on the sleeves, my double pointed needles uh, for four and a half millimeter needle, like my four and a half millimeter double pointed needles were just not very good and the stitches weren't great. Um, oh, that's Ben and Fela home. Um, so instead I basically just used needles that I had instead. And I don't mind how it looks. Um, there's a bit of laddering. It's, and I always kind of go with a, a wash out, but I know lots of people don't feel that way. Um, and maybe it's also just not really something people talk about. I think that's why I really like podcasts because it gives you that opportunity to say, um, you know, like, oh, this isn't that good or show mistakes or show how you fix things. Whereas I feel like, you know, people's Instagram grids, uh, you see, well, you know, maybe I take, say, 40 pictures of a sweater and five of them you ever see. So it can often seem like projects are very perfect. Um, and I definitely don't want to come across that way, not even on Instagram, but especially not on my podcast. So yes, I thought I'd talk a bit about perfectionism in knitting and I'd love to hear how you feel about it. I also think for me, um, perfectionism in knitting um, 
when I test knit something, I am much more diligent than I am with anything else. I feel quite strongly about um, that you're helping designers and that you want to deliver good feedback and that I would be sad if I test knitted a size and didn't comment on something or uh, something wasn't right and it was all because, you know, I said, oh, the sleeves have an awkward fit or they're too wide, uh, which has happened in the past. And then when I mess it, mess, measured gauge, I realised I was off by like two stitches. And obviously the sleeves were too big because my gauge didn't fit. But you could see how if you weren't on top of these things, you could give bad feedback to the designer, right? So I also think that's why I took a bit of a step back from test knitting. Um, but I will speak more about test knitting in a minute. Um, so yes, I should, um, I'm going to pop in, so, oops. <laughs> um, so this is a true behind the scenes, but if you, on, if you film on an iPhone and you have an Apple watch, if you didn't know, there's actually a little remote control. So often when I film, I check in on my Apple watch, um, to make sure that things are still recording, that I'm in screen, whatever. Uh, so whenever I did things like I just did where I hit the tripod, I like to double check on the watch, um, that the, the picture looks good. It's also really good um, for taking Instagram photos, though I use an app called Lens Body, where you essentially, it takes like a certain amount of photos for you in a time frame. Anywho, a uh, little tip. I am now gonna have um, a bit of a different segment. So um, essentially when you make podcasts, you get offered um, lots of, you get offered different things, right? And I don't think I've been offered as much as some people. I don't think I appeal <laughs> to brands as much as some. Um, however, I was contacted by BenQ, which is an electronics brand. Um, I know because we used to own a computer monitor from them and they, it was one of those messages. And I know I've seen at least one other YouTuber talk about this product. Um, it was one of those messages as they said, we like, this sounds like a scam, but it truly isn't. Um, so they contacted me to ask if I would um, speak about their lamp. Um, you know, if they sent me a lamp for free, would I talk about it? And the funny thing is, um, I'll put in some some lovely B-roll. I'm obviously not like all awesome knits that does proper nice and neat shots. Um, um, but you, so you have to excuse the dark, but I wanted to show it how it actually is. But um, like most knitters, vast majority, like 95% of my knitting is done on the same spot in the sofa, watching the telly, it's often dark, especially now that it's getting dark earlier. And that corner used to actually have the lamp, you see in the background here, the Ikea lamp, and it was quite dark. Um, and I kind of hit that point where I was like, it was on my list um, to buy a nicer lamp for that corner. So when they contacted me, I was like, this just seems too good to be true. Um, I should also say that um, my partner would watch the telly in complete darkness he's very much a cinema person in the sense that he does not want like light in the room so we've often had discussions around the fact that i need light for knitting to see what i'm doing and he wants it completely dark to watch the telly uh, so he doesn't want to be blinded by the light and um i think with the ikea lamp he didn't mind us mind it as much but it wasn't the lamp just didn't give enough light to be honest for it gave enough if like you're just knitting round and round and round and round, but not enough for, for actually counting stitches or anything like that. So um, when they offered me the lamp, I said yes. Um, I might just pull up. They basically send you like information about this lamp, which I should probably talk about. Um, the lamp is not cheap. Um, I'm just going to be completely honest and say that I am not sure. I'm not sure I would have bought it. Yes, so the BenQ lamp is called the BenQ e-reading desk lamp and it's um, it's quite a fancy lamp in the sense it has like a nice curve, it's meant to basically, be, I guess, like, give more light to a room which is why it's so good. It has um, adjustable colour temperature and brightness which I'll talk about and it's really good for having true colour representation which is also not bad. Um, and then there's a sensor to have like a smart reading mode um, then it talks about where you can have it different places um, all of these things I'll put at the links to device down below where you can buy it um, and yeah I have to say that um, again that the price would have put me off originally um, however now that I have it 
holy bejesus do I love it. I was speaking to Ben and I was like, how the hell do I do a review where I sound earnest and not like I've been paid to say it? Um, because I know it's a bit of an untraditional thing to have sponsored. Um, but as I said, I needed a lamp for that knitting corner and I was like, looks brilliant. I'll give it a go. But it is so convenient because um, what actually works the best for us is that sometimes I need very bright light. You know, if you're doing something very small and fiddly, you want proper bright light. And if I'm on my own, I will probably have it brighter than if Ben is around. But if we're watching the telly and I'm just knitting round and round and round and I just want to make sure I'm not dropping stitches, it's really important that you can turn it right down. And um, I have seen other of you say that maybe it's too bright, even at the light, like lowest setting. I don't think that at all. I asked Ben if he thought so and he doesn't think so either. So it's got the stamp of approval from Ben as well. Um, and it is quite good in that I can, you can tilt it. So it has to arm and you can tilt it this way and then it has to round sort of lamp and you can tilt that as well. I will say for us and for my setup where I knit, it would have been better if it was just straight. I don't actually need need the curve. Um, and I do think that that would make it bleed out less into the room. But then that's also the selling point that it would, could light up a very big room. Um, as you can turn up and down the brightness, you can also change uh, the sort of temperature of the the color or like the, the temperature of the light. And um, for for most of my knitting time, I just have it set on basically the the warmest light because that suits like a crazy living room environment. But I could totally see back when I was a student and you you know it's like eleven o'clock at night and you are trying to write an essay last minute that it would have been very useful to have something that felt very much like daylight, but also have it as mood lighting. Um, I have probably never been good enough at buying nice lamps. And for me, this really hits the spot. So um, yeah, I probably will not say yes to many sponsorships, but unfortunately I could not, I just couldn't let this pass me by. And um, if you do, if you are looking for an investment when it comes to a lamp, I would really highly recommend it. Um, both Ben and I think it looks stylish enough to not be a problem. It's in our living room full time. And for me, it's been amazing to knit with. Um, besides that angle that sometimes me and Ben does tell me to tilt it a little bit more, it has never caused any sort of like annoyance to either of us. Um, and for that, it is worth its weight in gold. So that's a little side point. Um, I'm just quickly gonna show you my, uh, the other whip that I have spoken about before. Um, because I think I've made a little bit of progress since we last spoke. Essentially, after I finished North Tan, or like after I started North Tan, I didn't really come back to this. So, um, the main thing I have done is finish the body. So this is sweater number. It still has quite a big. You can see that it's quite a big loose gauge right there in the back. That's strange. Anyway, this is sweater number one from my favorite things knitwear. Um, it has the same front and back, it has no short rows, it's a very simple pattern, uh, raglan increases, um, Italian tablet cast on, on this as uh, like just pure ribbing. And then I just need to knit two sleeves, which will not take long, so I will probably do that very soon. So yes, I've finished the body, put ribbing and Italian bind off. It is knit in two strands of my hair. The my hair is from uh, Tender Grunt. I bought it in Denmark, I have some left over yarn sticking. Um, yes, so this is what the yarn looks like. Um, yeah, so this was very much like a palette cleanser project, I guess you could call it. And I will return to it, um, but obviously a bright pink mohair sweater with a puppy with sharp teeth and little claws that get stuck in things. This is not one that will see much use for at least a little while. So um, I will probably have I'll probably cast on the sleeves or like get ready to knit the sleeves and just have it as like a back off project. But so far so good. Um, took me no time to knit the body because it's knit on, uh, well you can see it by how see through it is, it's knit quite loose gauge. Um, so uh, it's knit on six millimeters recommended. I knit on seven millimeter needles and knit a size down based on the positive ease because I do want it a little bit oversized. And um what was I gonna say yeah original pattern has like this kind of length sleeves but I'm always cold and so I reckon I'll knit it full length I do I should not have enough yarn for that so that's the plan so that's my other sort of proper ongoing whip um 
Now I'm going to talk about what I have coming up. Um, so hopefully, should we quickly check the time and make sure I haven't spoken for an eternity? Well, 43 minutes, I'll take that. That's not too bad. Um, so what I have coming up, um, something I'm really excited for, it's stored in this bag. Um, it's bags galore in here, isn't it? I um, was saying I was going to talk more about test knitting. So here we go. Um, because as much as I said in the last episode um, that I was done with test knitting for quite a long time and I really just wanted, just like I said with North Time, like I wanted like a project where I didn't have to be so conscious of how I was knitting, of any mistakes, of the gauge, of um, the fit, like I just wanted to knit to enjoy it. Um, well, I said that, but then um, Hive Knits or Lissy, um, she is one of the people I talk to most to on Instagram. And Lissy has, also, well, she also has a podcast that I'll link down below, but Lissy also has recently, or well, she's about to release her first sweater called The First Sweater. And um, when Lissy was like, oh, I'm not far away calling for testers, I basically was like, oh, I, I really want to test it, but I'm just not sure. And she's like, please don't feel like obligated to offer. Um, she watches my podcast. She's like, I completely understand that you maybe want to be off a break and like basically saying I won't take it personal if you don't apply. And I gave it like a lot of thought and then I saw. So I love the design from from the very get go. Um, her design is very much something I would design if I had any desire to design projects, which uh, it hasn't turned up yet. Um, <laughs> not to say that I don't one day wake up and I'm like, oh, I'm going to design my first sweater. But I have actually had zero desire to freestyle knit, really. So um, it's not coming anytime soon. Um, but her the sweater is um, double folded collar. Well, I'll put a picture in so you can see it while I talk about it. It's double folded collar. Um, it's half fisherman's rib for the sleeves that are nice and balloon and then just stockinette body. Um, knit in a combination of Aveta and uh, Tilia from Phil Colonna. And um, this is my gauge swatch right here. So you can see that fisherman's rib and the stock net. Um, and yeah, I was, I was on and on for a little bit because it's that kind of like, um, obviously my knitting friends, um, a few of them do design things and I always feel very guilty that I haven't tested for any of them. I basically have only knitted Danish patterns for the past year, probably. Um, but then I saw that Lissy had put, uh, for my size, I think it's 12 weeks of time to basically knit a finished garment, or at least um, I think you can, she's okay if you haven't finished both sleeves, but just one. And um, 12 weeks is just exactly the type of deadline I can work to right now, because if something is off and I need to rip it back or I need to start over or something comes in from the sideline and I really want to finish that, I'm not like rushing to get a sweater on what is quite small needles done. Um, this gauge is on four and a half millimeter needles and with no explanation for it. Um, so this was my first one um, where I knitted the half, half fisherman's rib wrong, um, but this is on four and a half millimeter needles. And this is on three and a half. Well, no, this is on four millimeters, like Lissy recommends in the pattern. And this is three and a half. Um, these have the same gauge, but to the naked eye, I can see this is looser. So I, I have no explanation, but I've counted both like 10 times. Um, so I'm going with three and a half because I think this fabric is much nicer and I think it will keep its shape much better than this will. Um, you can almost see it like the the difference in like stretch between the two. So I reckon this would get quite frumpy. Um, yeah, as I was saying, but it is quite small, small needles. Um, so I basically decided that it, as it isn't like a rush to get it done and it will basically see me till the end of this year. I was like, that is, that is something I can say yes to without it being something that makes me feel guilty because that is how test knitting can also make you feel. You know, every time you knit on something else, you just feel like, oh, I should really be working on this other project. Um, so, yes. And another benefit was that, um, sorry, should stop checking my phone. Um, 
another good thing was so um Simona from Knit who I buy lots of yarn from as you know I also speak to Simona on a daily basis um she was actually kindly offering a discount code for test knitters however um in August last year when I was interviewing for my current job um when you you know when you're like about to have a job interview you're always really nervous and this one was virtual so I, I was like sitting in my home all nervous and like strangely dressed up from having literally sat in my pajamas since we got sent home and I bought um this combination of Aveta and Telia I reckon I asked him when, well, like Simone and I were talking about this being in my stash and I was like she thinks I bought it for a balloon sweater which sounds reasonable to me I think this is the recommended yarn for a balloon sweater from Petite Knit so I reckon that is what I bought it for, but I don't actually know. Could have bought it for anything, really. Um, but I already had this in my stash and um, I really want to knit through my stash. I speak about this every episode and every episode, just like today, the small yarn. However, I am trying to make a concerted effort to knit through what I have. And I feel like once yarn has been in your stash for over a year, it's time to use it. You know, it's not like you bought a project and you just had to finish something and you then cast it on like over years and long time for something to go and use. So, yes, I basically was like, this will be perfect. And I also think this colour, uh, so that both of these are in the colour Red Squirrel. Um, both of these just like, I think it makes, it will be perfect because it has that autumnal, autumnal colour. I love this kind of burnt orange colour. I think it really like suits my colouring as well, does it? In this light, it doesn't. It makes my hair look quite not very nice colour, but I think it does. I think it's just because, as you can tell, it's getting dark. Um, God, we have some ambiance in here. Anyway, um, yeah, so I thought I would just actually get this used um, instead. So, yeah, I am going to be using this yarn that was already in my sash, which I haven't bought with a discount, and I bought this yarn before I knew Simona personally. So... Yes, very excited to get this used up and get started on this. Um, the official start of the test knit is tomorrow. Um, and um, I want to finish North Stand before I cast on because I am finding more and more that I am becoming almost fully monogamous in my knitting. That once I have a project, I just want to knit that project. And so I know that if I start this project, it might mean that the North Stand doesn't get finished. And that is a sweater I'm knitting to use. You know, it's not like, um, you know, the pink um, sweater number one that I know will not be used when it's finished for a while. Um, you know, Nordstein is a sweater I will literally wash the same day it's done and wear as soon as it's dry. So I do want to get that off my needles. And also because I think it removes a bit of stress. Um, yes, and I do have uh, some other sort of projects in the pipeline I might do alongside the good thing is that once you've sort of done the body you know like once you've done the, the yoke of the sweater which has short rows and the fisherman's rib and all of these things and you know you have to keep track of quite a few things um at some point it'll just be the longest body ever probably to knit so once I kind of get to that stage it's going to be quite mindless knitting and also probably quite a lot faster um for the fisherman's rib um I think that might take a bit longer, but once you get in the rhythm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, I um, have spoken about knitting needles before, but I'm just gonna, I've spoken for much longer than I was planning to. I'm just gonna quickly say that I have been using my Knit Pro Sings, which are like metal needles that have um, like different colors. Let's see, pick this up again, hoping not to drop like 20 stitches. They look like this, um, but these aren't particularly um, like pointy. I don't know if you can tell. Um, so for this project, I am actually going to be using, and I have gauge swatched on these as well, I should say. Um, so for these, I decided instead to use um, my um, pony, what are they called? They're just the pony needles, but I can't remember what the wood is called. Um, I think this series has a specific name. As it's getting dark, it might be harder to see, but um, the difference is that the the knit pros, this is quite a small size. It's much more, that tapering off the tip is very pronounced on the bigger sizes. Um, whereas, and it's much sharper. Some of the pony ones can be so sharp, you have to basically take a nail file to them, not to rip your fingers to shreds. 
and this these aren't particularly pointy i find these are great for you know they are nice and slick you knit really quick on them but i find that the pony ones are um i've knitted a few at least one project maybe more on these um two projects maybe because i have over time collected a few of the pony ones um i can show you in here so um my pony needles live in here um so i will show you like a bigger needle size so this is i think this is a seven millimeter needle so hopefully you can see here that it has quite a distinctive like it tapers in quite early on on the needle like this tapering is quite long compared to say the the knit pro ones um and then it has like a second taper just at the very tip um and um the wood is um similar to sim knit pro symphonies so they are fairly soft um but yes i decided to knit on these because i think i need a bit of a change in the knitting needles that i use um and i bought these and basically supplemented um some of my other ones um when i bought the knitting ring from no frills knitting uh, she stocks these knit pro needles and they are very good i would recommend them if you are a, a wooden needle person one thing i really like about them is that i don't know if you can tell that while this does kink um it is quite a bendable like flexible um it's not too bad for like keeping kinks in it compared to my um knit pros that are just like once a knit knit pro cable has been in a position it will stay in that forever so i also thought that um for the sleeves i might do them on magic loop because i this is well the needles were sort of an acquisition but i have bought well aveta is technically a sock yarn but i bought my first yarn intended for to be used for a sock um i watch a podcast called do we so and so uh, that's hosted by the lovely Cass and she lives up in very northern Scotland and um, she just has like that vibe that a Scottish grandma should have like you just want to come over and like sit in her little cottage and drink tea and eat biscuits and talk about knitting and the fires going like that's the kind of vibe she gives off uh, she makes some beautiful projects and she also has um, a little um like dying business called a uh, gardener's cottage yarn and basically from what i can see all her yarn bases are for socks so that means they all are basically some combination of super sop super wash merino and nylon and um cass um recently lost well in i think springtime um suddenly and unexpectedly lost um her partner and um her partner david her husband david um he just didn't wake up one morning and the way he like, throughout all her podcast she always speaks so fondly of david it's like that kind of bond that's just so rare um and in the she's literally just made her first podcast since coming back and it broke my heart to watch her talk about david and to talk about their life together and about like honoring him and his memory and he was always very very supportive of her yarn dyeing business and her crafting and it just touched something in me and it's one of those that obviously she doesn't know me i can't like knock on her door and give her a hug um so i did the next best thing and i thought you know what i'll buy some of her beautiful hand dyed yarn um because i felt like i really wanted to show support for uh, someone that i really really like um, so I bought, this came in like a set together, so this colour is called Fairy Glen and this colour is called Wine. I'm sure you are not surprised I picked the wine colour, clearly trend. Um, and then um, she had this mini skein that I just thought looked really pretty uh, called Shell Cottage. Um, so I guess, you know, these 20 gram mini skeins I could probably pair with a full coloured like Arvetta. Um, you know, you could pair i actually think these are quite well that's a bit of actually these could be quite a cute match would you look at that i think i'll have yarn left over so maybe these will become socks um yeah so because uh, a vetter 
is yeah, eighty percent superwash merino and twenty percent nylon was this is seventy five and twenty five. I'm sure it won't make much of a difference. Um, so yes, I will at some point have to actually knit a pair of socks, which I've put off for quite a long time. Um, obviously Laura from Penrose Knits is a sock queen and has made some beautiful designs and she's like, just do it, you'll be fine. Um, I also wrote to Maya from, um, I don't know how to say your name, Maya, um, from Poem. Uh, she also has a podcast um, that I that's called Are You Knitting Again? Though it is in Danish, so it's Trager du Again. And um, I love Maya's podcast. She is one of my favourite podcasters. She's like, you know, one of those that they upload and you're like, right, day is post to watch it. So I wrote um, like a little fangirl to Maya and said, I know you're brilliant with socks. Could you kind of give me an idea of what, like, where would be a good place to start? So she recommended a few patterns. So basically, I've never knit a pair of socks. So I need a pattern that describes a good heel and toe with a good fit. Um, but equally, I would kind of like them to have a little bit of something on them. If I'm going to go through the effort of knitting a pair of socks, I don't think I want them just to be plain, at least not for this special yarn. I might buy a Veta or something else that is a bit less precious um, for a pair of like basic socks. Or I've considered, I bought a long time ago the Sunday socks pattern from Petite Knit, where the recommended yarn is actually... Um, Peruvian Highland wool and I have some balls in my stash that I bought for those socks ages ago and they are knit on four and a half millimeter needles obviously with the caveat that Peruvian Highland wool has no nylon in it meaning it won't wear great but I could probably live with that I might I could probably pair some maybe some mohair from my stash with it maybe like some I have a some mohair like a mohair maybe nylon i can't remember what it's not silk in it um that i could maybe pair maybe that would give some wear you could let me know down below but anyway so she recommended some patterns um for good beginner sock because i know there are videos and i've watched videos that show you the whole process but i quite like a pattern and again i wouldn't mind some very easy lace and the big decision is then also if i should do magic loop if i should do I don't think short circulars are my thing because of the way I hold um, my yarn and tension my yarn or if I should give magic loop a go but to return all the way back to these that's why I think maybe if I knit the sleeves for that project using magic loop I could get in some practice with magic loop because I am um, as you might be able to see this is um, from Susanne Greene um, if you are Scan Scandinavia based, I think there's some Swiss on a down south in the UK, but I don't actually know for sure, but I bought that in here and it's obviously meant for pencils. Um, but this is all my uh, double pointed needles and that's always what I use for the end of sleeves. Um, I just don't think, I've tried before casting on, on double pointed needles and I don't think they're very forgiving. I don't think double pointed needles are very forgiving. And I started having more laddering, so I also wonder if I've become a bit too lazy with double pointed needles. At least with Magic Loop, you have less of a join, so I have to see. Maybe I'll take it home. My granny and it's lots of socks, so maybe she could help me. And that is the acquisitions. I thought, as a little side note, because I, I really should finish up soon. Um, I'm just going to tidy up a little bit because I have made a mess. Um, I thought, you know, this basket is um, actually where all my um, knitting needles live. Um, I think I've shown this before after Christmas. This is from, oops, this is from um, Knit Pro and it has these little sleeves. And this is where I keep all my 40 centimetre needles and my pony cables and stuff. Um, but most of that just live in um, this basket that I bought from Donnell. Um, which had to move upstairs because Fela once got her head stuck in here, which was terrifying. It used to live down in the living room. But yeah, this is where it all lives up here. Um, so as a final bit, I thought I should, obviously my goal is that I bought that sock yarn, but I I blame you, Sophie, from Knit, the Knit Pearl Girl, from um, making me look at rustic yarn on Etsy. So I won't guarantee that there won't be some rustic yarn, UK-based rustic yarn. 
in my future. I haven't bought any yet, but my Etsy cart is quite full. So I might might buy some of that. And I don't really think that counts. That's fine. Um, but in general, I'm really wanting um, to knit through most of my stash. So for dog walking, I am quite keen to knit a Bella Clava, I guess is the English name for it. Um, as a Dane, um, I would obviously call it an elephant hall, but I understand that that doesn't sound as good as a Bella Clava. It sounds a lot more fashionable. Um, elephant hall is like something children children wear. It's called an elephant hat. Why? No idea, but that's what it's called. Um, and so to knit through my stash, I thought I'd show you a project. So Bella Clava is on my list and I think think I might knit the balaclava from my favourite things knitwear that has like cables on it. I'll pop in a picture. So I went into my stash and I was like, I can definitely find yarn for that in my stash. So um, I have the Sanders course. Course is the Danish word for hygge or Danish word, the Norwegian word for hygge. So course is like, it's crazy basically. So I have that yarn in my stash. And um, when I bought that, this I used for my cardigan number seven for my favorite things that wear which is one of my most worn knits and i also have camel also monostroller which is like a my hair replacement um that um have like a silver a bit of silver through so i think this i have two balls of both left so i think that might become that and might be one of those projects that i kind of have alongside a sweater project because i do need to knit through my sash um yeah i was thinking about showing all the sweaters i've worn, worn around um Fela, uh, and talk about again imperfect knitting and being okay with that however i think i've spoken for far enough it's definitely gone proper dark um so <laughs> let's look at the time yeah it's, it's probably time for me to finish up today so i might do that next time um yeah it always feels a bit like when when you film podcasts, you spend days uh, thinking about what you're going to talk about, what projects you're going to show and all of these things. And it always feels a bit strange when it's all done. Um, so I'm hoping I won't see you in too long. Um, let's hope for about two weeks. And at that point, I'm hoping Nordstrand will be done and um, that I will have started on the first sweater test knit for Hive Knits or Lissy. Um, but yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and writing comments and reaching out. Um, in the last episode, I spoke about being lonely and I had some people reach out and say that I'm not alone. And um, it's always kind of lovely when you share something that makes you feel quite vulnerable, um, that someone sort of reaches out and and says, you know, it's not just you um, because um, as much as I pride myself, you know, I've always kind of thought that if you are honest about your vulnerabilities, that it kind of becomes more of a strength than a weakness. That doesn't mean, you know, when you share content online that you don't sometimes question if you really should. So, um, yes, just wanted to say thank you very much for that. And that is all I had to say for today. So thank you so much for watching. Um, please like and comment and subscribe and I will see you soon. Bye.